Welcome to the first installment of the COVID Debates brought to you by the University of Toronto Department of Medicine and Healthy Debate. My name is Mira Burns. I will be moderating this debate on behalf of Healthy Debate. We are thrilled that you can join us. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to do so. So what is a debate? A debate is a structured discussion around a particular topic in which opposing arguments are put forward, discussed, and argued in a respectful and professional way. The resolution before us today is be it resolved that school closures should never be used as a tool to control the spread of COVID-19. Now, a resolution is not something that is inherently right or wrong, but a statement that can be defended or disputed, but most importantly discussed. Our event today was inspired by the heated discussion stemming from these stressful times. People have always been passionate about health and they've always been passionate about politics. And now in the COVID era, health and politics have come together in an unprecedented way, leading to extreme polarizing perspectives and voices. Science is being used to take extreme positions, but those of us in the data sciences know that many gray areas exist in the interpretation of data. Healthy debate was approached by the Department of Medicine because of a noted breakdown in respectful and professional dialogue between members of our profession. The Department of Medicine knew we could do better. So together we bring you the COVID debates, a series of debates around relevant controversial topics. The goal of today is to provide our audience with informed evidence-based information in a respectful and professional way. We ask that you listen with an open mind to something that may initially go against the grain, but has the potential to bring you more depth in your understanding of this topic. We ask that you remember that data can be interpreted in many ways, and it is worth listening to how other people interpret it. Some housekeeping, you will notice that this is not an interactive session. However, we would love to hear your thoughts and comments at hashtag healthy debate at any point during the debate. Also, our speakers have volunteered their precious time and generously so. So any feedback to them on Twitter or otherwise on their content or messaging should be done respectfully and professionally and in a way that represents our profession. The structure of the debate itself will last one hour with everyone getting an opportunity for the opening statements followed by a question and answer session. As you'll note, there are different times for the different speakers noting that the pro side has three speakers and the con side has two speakers. So the order and the time lengths are done to ensure fairness. Finally, we will end with rebuttal and closing remarks. All the speakers will be timed also to ensure fairness with each side getting equal speaking time. There'll be cues for one minute remaining, 30 seconds and time's up and the speakers will be muted at the end of their time. So the resolution before us today is be it resolved that school closures should never be used as a tool to control the spread of COVID-19. Arguing the pro side that schools should have never closed and should never be closed for COVID. We have Dr. Ari Bittman, Dr. Jennifer Grant and Dr. Martha Fulford. Arguing on the con side, that say never say never and desperate calls may, desperate times, sorry, may call for desperate measures, including school closures. We have Dr. Andrew Morris and Dr. Colin Furness. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Ari Bittnan to deliver the opening remarks of the day. Dr. Bittnan is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the U of T and an infectious disease specialist at the Hospital for Sick Children. He's been doing this since before I knew what antibiotics were. He was the key author of the COVID-19 Guidance for School Reopening Report that came out of Sick Kids. It's an honor to have you, Dr. Bittman. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for arranging this event. It is my strong opinion that schools have never been, should have never been closed, that they should be reopened immediately, and that come September, schools should be open to, uh, with limited, if any, restrictions, assuming good vaccine uptake. I'm going to discuss two aspects relevant to this topic. One is the direct risks of SARS-CoV-2 to, ch to children, and second, some of the evidence pertaining to school safety. So with respect to the risk of SARS-CoV-2, if there is a silver lining to this terrible pandemic, it is the fact that children have not, been, have not gotten severe disease. One can only imagine what the, this would have looked like if children were more significantly affected. So as it is in reality, at least a third, if not 50% of younger children have no symptoms at all. And if they do have symptoms, they tend to be mild. It is only a small proportion of children that go on and develop severe disease, 
either in the form of acute COVID-19 or perhaps more commonly even the post-infectious multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. I would point out, however, that during this pandemic, there have been no deaths among children admitted to sick kids with either of these conditions. And my own experience in managing these is they respond very well to treatment and their outcomes are generally quite good. So our findings at SickKids are mirrored by Canania data. If you look at, uh, as of June 4th, there were approximately 260,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 among children, approximately 1,200 admissions to hospital, approximately 160 ICU admissions and 11 deaths. So while every death in a child is tragic, it's important to put this number in perspective. This translates to a case fatality rate of less than 0.01%. Okay, so I think an infection that is useful to compare COVID-19 to in children, it may not be relevant for adults, but for children it is, and that is influenza. So if we take the 2018-2019 influenza season, which was not a particularly bad year, there were 1,300 odd admissions to hospital, 270 ICU admissions, and 10 deaths. So basically in the same ballpark as COVID-19 and over a shorter time frame. So what this tells us is children suffer adverse consequences about the same with these two infections. Yet, for some reason, we continue to hear that school closures are needed to quote unquote keep, keep children safe. This is hogwash. Okay, my second thing I wanna talk about is school safety. There have been many, many studies so far looking at SARS-CoV transmission in schools using different methodologies, methodologies in different countries with different mitigation processes in place. There are limitations to all of these studies, but in aggregate, they strongly suggest that with appropriate precautions in place, schools are safe, and that with few exceptions, there is not much- One minute trust warning. In schools. I will give a couple of examples. Many of you probably heard earlier on in the pandemic about a school outbreak that occurred in Israel. This was widely publicized in the media, but there was a follow-up study using national data from Israel showing uh, some much, uh, showing basically that schools were not significantly associated with in increase in cases or hospitalizations. What they did show is a predominant factor was the loosening of restrictions with respect to large community gatherings. Uh, second example is from Wisconsin, um, where um, the test positivity rate in the community was up to 40%, and they basically showed that uh, cases in schools were much less common than cases in the community. And of the 190 cases that were identified in school, only seven were attributable to school transmission. And lastly, some data that, I have, I, that Aaron Campigoto agreed that I share, a sequencing analysis of uh, eight Time. clusters of schools in the GTA showed that most infections, well, there were many strains that the mo in, in each outbreak suggesting acquisition in the community rather than in the school. So to summarize, SARS-CoV-2 is a mild illness in children. Most transmission does not happen in schools. Schools should remain open. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bittman. It's very clear your expertise in this uh, when, you, when you tell us your stories. Um, your report out of Sick Kids Reopening Schools made some recommendations for safe reopenings, ventilation, um, hand washing, uh, Dr. Morris, in some of his work, has recommended emphasizing vaccines. Unfortunately, our government has not taken up any of these recommendations. So in today's real politique world, what is your approach to open regardless of the safety measures that are in place or just to wait until they're in place? What are your thoughts? So my thoughts are we already, as I've just said, are the data show that schools are generally safe. And yes, it's true that the mitigation efforts that have been put in place have not been fully implemented and it varies from school to school. A good example of that is ventilation is one that much needs to be improved, but we already have safety data. So from my point of view, there's no reason not to, not to uh, open school. I agree vaccines are key. And as we ramp up vaccines, especially in the adults, there should be even less reason to keep schools closed because that's probably the most important preventive measure. I also think that it's important to re-emphasize that the disease is mild in children and there's no evidence that with variants it's any different. So 
uh, I think that's uh, that the school should open. I think long term improving ventilation is an important consideration because this has applica has applicability not just to SARS-CoV-2. It's important for other infections and just for good air quality. So long term, I think that's an important thing that we need to work on. Thank you. A follow up question to that, Dr. Bittman. What do you have to say to the teachers who are feeling unsafe to go back to school um, when their vaccinations are not being made a priority? Okay, so I think uh, Martha is going to address this to some extent, so I don't want to steal her thunder, but I'll just say that there are data on, on risk to teachers, and, and generally speaking, speaking, the data is very reassuring. Um, and also, I think uh, by the time we get to September, I think most teachers should already be vaccinated. So September, I agree. I think that the risk is much lower. Do you think this would have been the same earlier in the year if we had never closed? Well, I think, as I said, the, the mitigation uh, that was in place and, and the studies looking at transmission in schools showed that schools were safe. Yes, there is some risk of transmission, but by and large, it was it, it was more transmission in the community Ten rather seconds. than the schools that was the issue. Thank you, Dr. Bittman. I'd now like to call upon Dr. Andrew Morris to deliver his rebuttal and opening remarks. Dr. Morris has been a youth basketball coach since 1987. In his spare time, he is a professor of infectious disease at Sinai Health. University Health Network and the University of Toronto. In preparing for this debate, he tells me that he Googled school and Googled kids to facilitate epistemic trespassing. Um, in addition to his Googling, Dr. Nor uh, Dr. Morris has been a key member of Ontario's COVID-19 scientific advisory table, translating in real time the enormous body of COVID-19 evidence into recommendations for public policy. His weekly evidence-based COVID update newsletter can be found at covidemails.com. Welcome Dr. Morris. Thanks for having me. And I brought a little cuddly friend just to show that I am uh, child friendly. Uh, and, and thanks for hosting this debate and uh, inviting me to participate. I was told I was meant to be collegial. Uh, that's not my strong suit, but I, I, I will uh, try and adhere to that as much as possible. I also want to point out that I barely passed my pediatrics training twice at SickKids, where Dr. Bittenden works. I got practically kicked out of McMaster University, where Dr. Fulford works after working there for six years. And uh, UBC, after inviting me to speak there as a visiting professor, decided to never invite me again. So my opponents already have started this debate from points of privilege and institutional disdain for me. Um, I also want to keep in mind that we're talking about kids age 16 to 17 in general. Some of you will have an image of some cuddly and smiley little six-year-old kid who angelically listens to a story in a reading circle. Uh, others of you will imagine a 15-year-old who's hiding their cell phone uh, either participating in or avoid, avoiding high school drama and thinking about what to do on Saturday night. And we're talking about both these kids and more when we discuss this. And finally, I wanna point out that as a member of the science table, I was someone who firmly believed that we could and should bring kids back to school last week, if not, er pardon me, if not earlier, um, but that's not what we're prosecuting today. What we are prosecuting is the resolution that school closures should never be used as a tool to control the spread of COVID-19. I'm gonna outline a few things. First of all, kids are vulnerable members of society. Well, except for Arthur, Arthur's a government puppet. As such, we should do everything possible to treat kids as A, vulnerable, and B, members of society. Recognizing that they're vulnerable, it means that protecting them from infectious diseases should be one of our highest priorities. The short-term consequences of COVID appear relatively minimal, as Dr. Bittenham pointed out, but we do know that COVID is not always benign for kids. And when there's lots of COVID, lots of kids will get infected. In fact, just last week, the US CDC looked at kids in 10 states from January to March of this year. Looking at over 200 adolescents, they found that nearly a third required ICU admission, 5% required being on a ventilator. We also know that adolescent COVID hospitalizations in the US were triple that of seasonal influenza in recent years. And as I think uh, Dr. Bittenham pointed out, but didn't allude to it perfectly, this is all despite efforts to control it in kids. My colleagues will try and tell you that it's not harmful to kids, but this is partially true, but mostly unknown. They won't tell you about the long-term consequences of COVID infection in children because they don't know. And because of that, we have no certainty about the long-term effects on kids who get long COVID. So how do we protect people vulnerable to infection? We use, a, we use a hierarchy of infection prevention and control, a slew of measures 
to prevent these diseases. With COVID, we know that indoor congregation is the highest risk for spread of infectious diseases. That risk may be less for kids and almost certainly is, and we can attenuate that risk even further, but we can't eliminate it. And that risk is highest when kid cases are spreading in communities. School is safe for kids when there's no COVID in the classrooms, which logically means also no COVID in the communities. I will also point out that kids are vulnerable because they need their parents, their grandparents, their guardians and teachers. In Canada, up to 25,000 parents, grandparents, guardians and teachers have died. Yes, kid need, kids need school, but they also need their adults healthy. In the US, it was estimated that over 40,000 children lost a parent to COVID in the first year of the pandemic. That number is almost certainly now doubled. And the kids most affected? the economically and socially disadvantaged kids. Yes, school is important for kid, for these kids, but you better believe that- One minute warning. And grandparents and other loved ones are just as important. Finally, I will point out that learning and playing is the work of kids and school is the workplace of kids, teachers and workers. So we should do everything to keep it safe for everyone. That means ventilation, masking, physical distancing, vaccines, et cetera, but kids are not in a bubble. These same people are part of our greater society. Accordingly, when there are waves in society, reducing indoor congregation is approved pillar of epidemic control. 30 seconds. My colleagues will almost certainly point out that kids in schools are not a driver of the pandemic and point to studies. Most of these are heavily biased and massively flawed. Apart from Dr. Tony Fauci himself just yesterday saying that kids transmit COVID, I will point out one basic fact. Of the 138 variants of concern, incidents identified and managed by Public Health England last week, half were in an educational set setting, half. Schools aren't involved in transmission? Nonsense. This debate is not about hypotheticals. It's about making decisions on the best information we have. Although kids often believe in magic, we should not think magically about kids. And entirely eliminating school closures from this or any future pandemic response is irresponsible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morris. What I really appreciate about your perspective is that we're not polarizing for kids, against kids, for schools, against schools. And I think what's making this debate very uh, compelling is how nuanced everyone is and how we're staying away from the black and whites to really explore that middle ground and figure out what the best solution is for kids. So thank you for your nuanced perspective. Yeah, can you just point out that I'm also right? You didn't mention that. You know, I, uh, I, I refrain from mentioning that. <laughs> I think you maybe thought that I would be swayed by your stuffed animal, but I, I see too so, many yeah. of those at homes and I've built up an immunity. <laughs> You, one of the downsides to the precautionary approach that you were talking about or the wait and watch approach with schools is public confusion. With every change in policy and with these changes happening in real time, there is an eroding of public trust. You know, people think, oh, well, we don't know what they're gonna say. So that means they don't know what they're doing. Um, and this kind of places a lot of the burden on family members and the caregivers to try and find last minute schooling strategies. And it's very, very skewed towards the people who have resources and extended family in the area um, and less skewed towards those with less social support. So how would you consider addressing this and communicating with parents and mothers who are disproportionately impacted by school closures and how can we maintain trust with the community when we're making decisions in real time and then going back on things we've said earlier? Thanks for the question. Um, I think I'll first say let's not confuse um, poor strategy and poor communication that, that's occurred throughout the pandemic as it relates to whether or not uh, kids can safely be in schools as part of it. Uh, I'm somebody who all along has felt that the best way to keep kids in school, and I think we should try everything possible to keep kids in school, is we focus our strategy on keeping cases in the community as low as possible. In fact, it, most times you, you can keep kids at school impossible, uh, um, for as long as possible, if not throughout. But unfortunately, um, what we haven't done is really clearly prioritized what's important to keep open and what is, I think, more modifiable. If we were to do that, then we would have um, pretty clear communication. 
I think in, in Ontario, for sure, one of our failures was articulating a strategy. Mm -hmm. We actually never had a strategy articulated. And if we had one, then we'd be able to communicate with parents much more clearly so that they, they would know what to expect over time, but they didn't know that. Absolutely, parents, especially moms, have been disproportionately affected uh, through this pandemic. And I think it is one of the, what will be everlasting uh, tragedies of this whole pandemic and our response. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Another question, let's talk about acceptable risk profiles. Okay, we take risks and we have acceptable risk profiles in medicine all the time, procedures, medications, there's potential harms we tolerate in order to reap the benefits, anesthesia for surgeries, bleeding risk with medications, um, schools opening during influenza season that Dr. Bittman talked about. Um, he also talked about transmission being rare. So let's say for argument's sake, because everyone is often quoting different studies, that the transmission is there, but it's a relatively low rate of transmission. Um, compared to the significant harms, economic, psychological, and social harms, um, that, you know, as we talked about, preferentially target our most vulnerable, what is different about this risk profile compared to the risk profile we take in medicine every day? Uh, so thanks for that. I, I think there's a few aspects to that. that 30 it's, seconds. It's important to note. One is that um, you can keep kids in, in school for quite a, a long period of time, but as we saw with our last wave, we were teetering on the precipice of total collapse of our healthcare system. And we were at a point where we didn't have many other choices other than to as much as possible uh, reduce transmission. Because I don't think kids are as important to transmission as some other workplaces, you can certainly uh, try and mitigate and delay um, you know, having kids uh, you know, be kept from school. But at a certain point, you, you just can't do that. And also, you know, in the pre-vaccine era, it was very different because we also had to protect teachers and other healthcare workers. It wasn't only the kids. And as somebody who took care of more than one teacher infected with COVID, I can tell you, you know, um, it, it did occur. Okay, fair. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, though minus points for paucity of basketball and COVID metaphors, I was really expecting a lot more based on your intro that you submitted to me. Um, now I'd like to invite Dr. Martha Fulford to deliver her rebuttal and opening remarks. Dr. Fulford is an associate professor at McMaster University. She's currently the chief of medicine at the McMaster University Medical Center and provides infectious disease consults for pediatric and adult populations. During the COVID pandemic, she has been a strong advocate for children, successfully raising widespread awareness of the collateral damage that is occurring from school closures. Thank you for being here, Dr. Fulford. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you, excuse me, thank you very much for arranging, uh, arranging this debate. My, po uh, my position, sorry, just a minute, uh, sorry. My position is very much that uh, schools uh, in the context of COVID did not need to close. They should have been reopened and moving forward that uh, schools should in fact be back to pre-pandemic scheduling come September. There are two areas I want to talk about. One is the safety of schools, and Dr. Morris has alluded to this. Dr. Bittman has already pointed out that we didn't have significant transmission in our schools. Uh, and I'd like to look specifically at the issue of safety and teachers. We keep hearing that schools need to be safe, and safe from what? We know that children are actually not at high risk uh, of an adverse event from COVID. And I think we have now dealt with COVID for long enough to know that long-term adverse effects are rare, uh, exceedingly rare. Uh, we know internationally, and even if we just want to look nationally from British Columbia, the schools can absolutely be kept open and control, uh, community transmission controlled. But specifically, let's look at the teachers. Are they at risk? We now have very good studies from Norway, from Sweden, from England, from Scotland, showing that teachers are at no higher risk than the baseline community risk. The study from Scotland by Fenton and all specifically looked at over 18,000 teachers with a data set of over 800,000. And when they looked at the risk for teachers and compared them to similar working age adults, teachers and their household members actually were not at increased risk of hospitalization and interestingly were actually at lower risk for severe disease. If we look at the data from Canada, from Ontario, when we closed our schools in April, school associated positivity rates in staff was 1.6%, that is all. And that's at a time when our community, rate, our community rates were around 10%. And of course, with teachers ineligible for vaccination, this already low risk is gonna be vastly reduced. 
But I think the important question is, what's the contrast? What's the cost of school closures? And by some of us, this is now being referred to as a shadow pandemic. We have a myriad of medical harms with the most prominent being the mental health issues. The recently published study from SickKids has shown that in children that were previously and otherwise entirely healthy, we are now seeing depression rates of 37.6%, anxiety 38%, Suicidality is increasing. For example, the Children's uh, Hospital of Colorado has recently declared a state of emergency due to the unprecedented growth in severe mental health, including suicidality, even in your, and children as young as 10. And of course, this is the end stage of mental health problems. So we can't afford to wait that long. BMJ Pediatrics has recently just uh, published a literature review. It looked at 22 studies and again, it demonstrates unequivocally that school closures are associated with worsening mental health and increasing unhealthy food consumption. And this is across many countries. We have certainly been seeing this in Ontario with dramatic increase in eating disorders in the range of 100% above base baseline. And the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, which has normally nine inpatient One minute warning. has 25 now uh, admissions. And then we look at the risk of interrupted education Education is one of the great equalizers of society and lack of access disproportionately affects those who are most vulnerable and marginalized. And the longer we have school closures, the further behind they will be left. Online schooling has resulted in a myriad of children who are now lost to the system. We don't even know how many this is, but estimates are that in Ontario alone, we have seconds. in the range of 100,000 children who are no longer accounted for in the system. They have simply disappeared from schooling. And where are the models that are projecting the impact of these harms and what, how many years of life lost because of this? So to summarize, I think schools have not been demonstrated to be unsafe, either to children or to teachers. They have been kept open in many jurisdictions, including most of Canada, while also successfully controlling community transmission. But the harms of the school closures, they're myriad, they're far reaching, Hi. and they're going to last a generation. So as adults, it is our obligation to do the least amount of harm to our children and it's for this reason that schools must be left open. Thank you, Dr. Fulford. Dr. Fulford, you made a very compelling argument for the collateral damage that is being done to children and families. Um, I think you call it your second uh, pandemic. Um, I don't think that there can be any disagreement about how devastating this has been for children. My question to you is when we talk about um, when we talk about school closures, this conversation has been very polarized for all closing versus all opening. Now Dr. Morris has clearly stated that schools should be the first to open and the last to close. Since we know that one size fits all solutions um, and approaches are often flawed in medicine and epidemiology, and that when we look at transmission data being minimal in schools, it's an aggregate of schools in hot spots and in low risk zones, is there room for a balanced approach? Some school closures in hot spots, closures in high risk age groups, but not for others, maybe keeping them open for people with um, special needs. What are your thoughts on a more nuanced approach to school closures rather than not at all? I think it's important to look across all jurisdictions when we think of school closures. And British Columbia is probably, for me, the most compelling example. They reopened their schools in June and never reclosed them. They made children and the health and well-being of children their priority uh, as, as for the province. And they had hot spots. They had uh, equivalent uh, increases in their curves. Their Fraser region was equivalent for appeal. And despite uh, very similar problems with escalating numbers, schools were kept open, children were looked after, they didn't see significant problems with it and their curves have, have equaled Ontario's in terms of coming down. So when we have a nuanced approach, I think if we had, if, if we had data now that, had show, that could actually show us that schools are transmitters, it would be a different conversation. But one of the things that's been, as Dr. Bitten uh, alluded to, one of the remarkably good news stories of COVID is number one, children aren't particularly susceptible, but number two, they're not as efficient at transmission. And despite all of our fears, nowhere have schools been shown to be dangerous and and it's a balance so so we it is our obligation as a society to look after the health and well-being of every member of our society in the way that they best deserve it and i appreciate dr morris's comment about parents and grandparents but 
we didn't have to close schools for that. We had to control community transmission. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we should be separating these two things. We should be uh, doing everything we can to, to preserve and maintain the health and well-being of our children while um, controlling community transmission. So as advocating for school uh, schools being open does not in any way mean that we, we don't have community measures in place to control transmission. These are not mutually exclusive conversations. Thank you, Dr. Fulford. Um, I appreciate your uh, separation between school closures for kids um, and community closures for families. Um, we don't have time for a follow-up question on that, but I think that maybe I'll leave that to the, the con team if they wanna bring something up. Um, I'd now like to call upon Dr. Jennifer Grant to deliver her rebuttal and opening remarks. Dr. Grant is a microbiology and infectious disease specialist at Vancouver General Hospital. She's been in Vancouver since 2007 and is currently the medical director of the Vancouver Coastal Health Aspires program, providing stewardship support for the coastal region of British Columbia. During the pandemic, she has done extensive research into the optimal use of antimicrobials and around occupational health of physicians. She's also a mom of three and passionate about this topic. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Grant. Hi, and I wanna thank all the panelists and all those people who are um, taking their time out to listen to us. And as um, Dr. Fulford and Dr. Bittenham have said, um, children are not particularly at risk and schools are not particularly um, areas of transmission, which brings us to our fiduciary responsibilities towards our children. Canada is a signatory to the uh, Convention on the International Rights of the Child. It's the most universally accepted of the UN conventions. And while there are many rights in that document, the two most pertinent to this discussion are the rights to education and the role of schools and education should be obvious to everyone. And the other is to be considered as a special population and have adults make decisions that are in the best interests of children. And both of these rights are being violated by the closure of schools. Um, I want to sort of point out that one of the uh, criteria in that uh, charter is that um, <clears throat> there must be every mitigation in place for schools um, and for education. And we have tried no mitigation in any of the places where schools were closed. We sent kids home with a computer and told them to manage. So I think we've done that poorly, but even so, um, it, closing schools has enormous uh, damage to our children, has, has been said. In terms of the um, right to be considered as a special population, school closure is all harm to children with no benefit. And I'm gonna address Dr. Morris's point about parents and grandparents in just a second. Um, but essentially we are throwing our children under the bus on this and making them take the heat for um, a pandemic for which they have no responsibility. Um, and then the question is, is this justified? And the answer to that is no, it isn't. Um, Doc, uh, Doug Ford gave a projection of 6 to 11% increase in community transmission of cases. And I want to point out, this is based on a mathematical model. Mathematical models are, at the end of the day, a form of make-believe. They're sophisticated make-believe, but they are utterly dependent on the assumptions underlying them and the um, analyses that are done, all of which are subject to any number of issues. Um, and when we have real world data, which we do, those models must take a back seat to the real world data. Um, and the real world data, as has been said already, show that transmission to communities in schools is low if it exists at all. When studies have been done, most have shown no particular um, association with schools. If there has uh, been a uh, signal shown, it's been small and it's been confounded. And when those confounders are corrected for, the, the um, contribution of schools to community transmission remains very low. So what about families? Are families at higher risk because their kids are going to school? And the answer is no. The UK did the safely study, which showed that parents and grandparents are at just the same risk, in fact, lower risk of mortality and death when children in their house, whether schools are opened or closed. And I want to finish with the BC experience because BC has had its schools open the whole time because the harm's done to children. In BC, um, even in the hotspots and through two waves of different um, variants of interest, transmission has been low 
The Cero surveys have shown exactly. that there's no higher rate in children um, going to school and not going to school. There has been one teacher admitted to hospital and it's not clear if that was caused by spread in the school versus community spread. So it can be done, it has been done, and this should be our model moving forward, regardless of what else happens, especially keeping in mind that this was done before vaccines were available through successive waves of different variants. Our children are safe in school. We need to stop throwing them under the bus. Thank you, Dr. Grant. As a passionate, uh, passionate speech, I can tell that this is not the first time you have talked about this or been triggered by it. Um, you know, one of the one of the problems with uh, taking a zero to hundred stance is that you'll always hear about the exceptions. So, on our panelist uh, in the chat today, someone said, "I one of the doctors said I had to send a less than five year old to sick kids," and we always heard, hear about like this person who had been sent to this person, our neighbor's kid sent to this. There aren't many of them. But the argument can be made that there is some risk to children or some risk to families. And I think because we don't necessarily have long-term data, um, we can't assume a zero transmission. And that's what um, uh, Dr. Morris and Dr. Furness will speak to as well, where that transition lies on the spectrum, if it's negligible versus not. Um, so let's say for argument's sake that there is a very, very small uh, risk of transmission in children because that some of the data is showing that, some of the data is showing that it's minimal, some of the data showing more substantial, but the answer is probably somewhere in between. So let's talk about mitigation of small risks in kids. When we are pregnant, um, we prioritize kids and mitigate the smallest risks. So safe sleeping guidelines to prevent sudden infant death, even though it's exceedingly rare, medications are unsafe until proven safe. We're not giving our vaccines to very young kids until the trials and data are available. So isn't it a bit strange that the ones who are at school, while the rest of us are safe and locked down, almost like guinea pigs are kids. As a society, if we deem to keep adults home safe and we put aside adult mental health issues and other metrics to stay safe, but we're putting kids in school saying that, you know, it's better for you to be in school so you don't have mental health, but that's not what the same thing is for the adults. So you know, thank you for the question. Um, and, and I think this comes to a, a much broader, deeper societal question that probably is worthy of another debate. Um, the principle that doing something is safer than staying the course. And I put to you, based on the data that have been presented, that it's not safer to have kids out of school. It is the experiment to pull kids out of school and lock them at home with parents, keeping in mind that in many situations, home is not safe. It may not be safe because of violence, but it may also not be safe because there's an adult that cannot manage child supervision. Um, it is not safe because when we look at the data, we can see clear harm from closing schools. It's, it's clear across the board, it's been noticed everywhere. Whereas the risks in school have been difficult to show if they exist at all. So, you know, I know that people are bringing up the precautionary principle, but it's being misapplied in this context. It is not precautionary to force children into a completely unnatural environment. The precautionary principle dictates that we keep kids in school until such time as we can prove that doing so is more harmful. You, you mentioned uh, the rights of the child document, um, but in the same document in Article 3, they say that parties shall ensure that the institutions, services, and facilities responsible for the care and protection of children shall conform to the standards established um, by the authorities, particularly for the areas of safety, health, and suitability of the staff, and constant supervision. So they're saying that the same standards that we apply to adults, the kids have the right to have those standards apply to them as well. No, it doesn't actually. It says that children okay. have the right to be considered as a special population. And when adult standards are inappropriate for children, which they are in this context because children are at substantially lower risk than adults, then that should not apply. Children need to be considered with their specific exactly. risk and benefit balance in mind. And so while I understand that people think that children should be treated as little adults, they shouldn't be. They need to be treated as children and as a special population. That's an excellent point. Okay, thank you, Dr. Grant. And thank you for your perspectives. Um, I would now like to invite Dr. Colin Furness to deliver his rebuttal and final opening remarks of the morning. 
Dr. Furness is an infection control epidemiologist and assistant professor at the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto. He also holds a cross appointment to the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the Dalai Lama School of Public Health. Dr. Furness has been an outspoken critic of Ontario's COVID-19 response. He's a strong advocate for the use of evidence-based epidemiological approaches in informing policy around COVID-19 control. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Furness. Thank you very much. And let me thank you uh, for the opportunity to come and speak to this august group. Um, I'd like to continue Dr. Morris's confession of medical mis education misdeeds to say that um, I didn't even get into medical school. And I think that says something really important. Uh, the admission process works. Uh, I like measurement a lot more than I like people. And so I think I ended up in exactly the right pigeonhole. And, and so I'm going to take a measurement based view of all of this. I think that's where wherever we disagree, I, I think I can point to measurement as actually being a problem. And let's be clear, I think there's a lot of things we can agree upon in terms of the difficulties uh, that we're all facing with closed schools and, and the collateral damage, no question. But, but my belief is that we need public health in schools to control COVID. And it's when we lose control that maybe we then need to close, maybe. But let's start with what do we mean by control? And, and the big focus here, of course, is closure. Um, what do we know about closing schools? Well, you know, as, a, as an infection control person, I've gotten very inured, very used to the limitations of observational research. That's something that a lot of people struggle with um, in terms of what can you say and not say about causality. There's a lot we can't say. But there's something that we can say, and that is one thing we know from international studies, several of them, one recently published in Science, another in Nature. When you close schools, Google mobility goes down. When Google mobility goes down, community transmission goes down. And so I do disagree with Dr. Fulford's suggestion that we can separate schools from communities. Schools are a, 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 not only they embedded in communities, they are communities in my estimation. In Ontario, we've got about two and a half million kids. And if you add all the bus drivers, teachers, support workers, you're, you're really talking about a, a distributed workplace of millions. This is community. So here's the thing. If we can drive COVID down by reducing mobility as measured by Google, and those associations are very clear, and schools accomplish that, it's not that every five-year-old is going to school with their cell phone. We're not measuring kids going to school. We're measuring all the other activity, the teachers, the support workers, the bus drivers. And here's the kicker, and I, it pains me to say it because it's, it sounds like I'm suggesting this is a great thing. It's not. Parents are stuck at home with their kids when their kids are at home. And actually, I, I certainly acknowledge everything Dr. Grant had to say about the risks and the harms there, no, no question. I think she, she said that very well. But the fact of the matter is the outcome of doing this dreadful thing leads to a drop in cases. It's what the UK did with their 117 variant, and it worked. And it's what a lot of places have done, and it worked. The fact that we do it for months on end has to do with bad COVID management. That's not the same thing. We could have been doing sharp, short closures. So let's not conflate closing schools and doing it really badly so they stay closed with the need to occasionally, when we lose control, use this as an effective means. So I'm all ears. If there's another way that we can achieve a gigantic drop in Google mobility, if there's another way, I'm absolutely all ears. I just don't see it. That's the problem is I just, unfortunately, I just don't see that. There's three, three different scenarios that, that, that have a lot in common. Restaurants, air travel, and schools. Not three things you would typically see stitched together. They've all got something really important in common, which is the debate tends to be emotional and there's a lack of evidence. No one's ever suggested testing servers. We know that airlines are hiding incident rates among air flight crews. And we have huge problems in Ontario and yes, also in BC in how data are gained. So I don't doubt the statistics that have been reported by my colleagues, but I doubt their veracity. I doubt their validity. And I'll give you one really good example. In BC for sure, and I believe in Ontario as well, if a kid is known to have gotten sick on a school bus and this happened in my son's school, that's not counted as in school transmission. That strikes me as being somewhat disingenuous. I think if we took a holistic view of transmission and we said, yeah, you know what? Getting on a school bus is part of going to school. It's part of being at school. That's a problem. And if we ignore it, we don't do anything about it. And that's, a, that's a, I think, a, a huge, huge problem I have. In other words, when we insist that schools are safe, we prevent remediation and measurement. That narrative, because it's politicians who are deciding what measurement happens and how. In Ontario in February, we said we were gonna test 2% of students every week. Well, we didn't. We tested a tiny, tiny fraction of that. With the positivity that was reported back then in February, uh, I did a calculation that said we may have 15,000 undiagnosed cases of COVID. And yes, 
in schools. And yes, it's asymptomatic. And yes, kids don't get very sick. But remember, in Northern Italy, when grandparents started dying in droves, they weren't the ones going to the parties. The kids, the teenagers, they felt fine. And this was what was so very baffling. That, that the fact of the matter is kids and older generations do get together, some places worse than others. And if you look at a country like Sweden, where everyone lives alone, where you don't have multi-generational living, uh, you don't have as big a problem. Northern Italy, New York City, some of these areas, you had really huge problems. So I really worry about our citing statistics and citing patterns fine. from other places and saying that, and saying that it's fine. Um, so the schools are safe narrative is, is the biggest obstacle we have. We haven't tested, we haven't done proper asymptomatic testing. We don't understand child transmission. Sarah Rasmussen's work in the UK suggests that child prevalence actually is independent of adult prevalence. Fascinating work. Too bad we haven't done any measurement to actually test that out and try to understand it. There's so many things about school built form we could have worked out, we could have figured out in order to make schools safe because I believe that some schools are inherently more risky than others. Thank you, Dr. Furness. I wish that you had been the one uh, advising Ford during his reopening and school closure strategies, because it sounds like what we needed was a better, better approach to data collection much, much earlier on. So I really, that really resonates, I think, with a lot of our, our listeners. Um, both yourself and Dr. Morris spoke about the precautionary principle, correct? In which, which is the assumption of avoiding harm when conclusive evidence is not yet available. By harm, until now, you've been talking about COVID-related illness and death. But in using this principle, you have not acknowledged the collateral harm what Dr. Fulford spoke of, and Dr. Grant and Dr. Bittman, which we now have evidence for. So the value judgment of physical health above mental health and other factors is deemed inherent in this approach. Why does this type of harm trumps the physical harm that we're talking about? Sorry, you're still muted, Dr. Furness. I'll repeat the question. Why does- no, I got it, I got okay. it, sorry. I forgot I forgot to unmute myself. That's probably the hardest question you could ask me. And I think um, I've got an escape answer. And the escape answer is if you shut schools long enough, these, the harm that accrues to children is gonna outstrip it, no question. We're assuming I somehow tacitly in this debate that when we close schools, we do it for many, many months. No, no, that's not the way this should have gone at all. I would never say that we should be closing schools for a very, very long period of time. Merely that sometimes when we lose control, we have to, to regain control. Um, there's other, other jurisdictions have closed and opened and closed and opened as they needed to. Um, this is the Atlantic province's zero COVID model. You close when you need to and you open when you can. So I think we, we wouldn't be having conversations about harm to children if schools were closed for a week or two weeks or even three weeks. It's the many, many months. And I am not going to deny, I'm a parent, <laughs> and I've got a zoo going on here in the background. I'm not going to deny the harm to kids, but I don't see it after a week or two weeks or three weeks. I see it after months. Okay, thank you, Dr. Furness. Um, my next question, we know that these are, times are unprecedented and the data we have access to is limited, as you said. Multiple panelists have spoken about the BC experience of schools staying open year round. How do you acknowledge the science that they use to make this decision and use their experience moving forward? We have different data sets. In retrospect, do we now have a clear understanding about how well these models have predicted subsequent real world outcomes? I'll go right back to the idea that it's politicians who are actually deciding the narrative more so than scientists. Uh, the, the measurement that was done in BC did no zero testing. Uh, it looked at it to set the bar very high. If you were outside of the school building and it wasn't clear that you were in the same class within 48 hours of another kid in the same class, it wasn't counted the school transmission. So they, they managed to game the numbers in a way to, to tell a narrative. In other words, BC set out to demonstrate schools were safe instead of asking the question, are schools safe? And that's what I really object to. I think if you took a more holistic view and said, let's look at school as seconds. an activity, not a building. Let's look at that as an activity. And if we could attribute cases on that basis, I think we would have a very different conclusion. Noted. Thank you, Dr. Furness. Um, this all makes sense to me. So at this point, I will give our speakers a chance to organize their remarks and prepare their final rebuttal and closing remarks. And just for those of you who are joining us a little bit late, you're watching the COVID debate brought to you by the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto and Healthy Debate. The resolution before us today is be it resolved that school closures should never be used as a tool to control the spread of COVID-19. Arguing on the pro side that schools 
should not have been and should never be closed for COVID, we have Dr. Ari Bittman, Dr. Jennifer Grant, and Dr. Martha Fulford. Arguing on the con side that never say never and desperate call times call for desperate measures, including school closures, we have Dr. Andrew Morris and Dr. Colin Furness. Our speakers have just delivered their strong opening remarks. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, please send them our way at hashtag healthy debate. We are now entering the third and final portion of the debate. Please note that the duration of remarks have been modified to ensure equal podium time for both sides. So Dr. Furness, unfortunately, you have had the least time to prepare, um, but I'd like to invite you to deliver your final rebuttal and closing remarks. Okay, yeah, well, since I couldn't finish my, <laughs> my other remarks, I can just keep on going. So I don't think it's so, so bad for me. Um, look, the idea that we should never close schools um, suggests that the epidemiology of COVID, the fact that it's changing, the fact that variants of concern are emerging, can't be a problem. I reject that. They can be. Evolutionary pressure is very clear. Where COVID is not successful, and we can all agree it's not successful in kids, all of us agree on that. Where it's not successful, there is plenty of room for it to evolve to become more so. And this is what we're seeing with some of the variants of concern. 117 was harder on kids than, than what, what we might call classic COVID. And the, uh, the Delta variant, 617, uh, may prove more so. I don't, want to be ca I don't want to catastrophize this, but I think we cannot say that variants don't matter. We cannot deny that evolutionary pressure may make this a problem for kids. At the very least, we need to be prepared to close schools if kids are going to get very sick. And I think that, if nothing else, means that the resolution really on its own can't stand. Um, so that, that one. So mostly, I think um, I wanted to talk about, or I'd already talked about uh, the BC experience with schools and the way that narrative came out. In BC and Ontario, we have teachers who are terrified. And I think it's cold comfort that we can say, well, teachers haven't really necessarily gotten sicker than others. It's really cold comfort. It's not okay to send people to workplaces in terror. And I think that is much worse than a communications problem. Teachers know. They've got classrooms without windows. They know they've got lousy ventilation. They were not allowed to have humidifiers, which would, which would provide at least a little bit of protection. And they were not even given simple CO2 monitors so that we could see what's going on. We never bothered to even pry open windows. We did nothing for people to feel safe. And then my last point is on mental health. I think, I think that summer breaks and March breaks don't cause mental health problems. Taking kids out of school doesn't cause mental health problems. Pandemics cause mental health problems. Domestic abuse is caused by COVID, by parents in distress. Psychiatric illness, I think, is probably somewhat contagious when you, when you have a family locked up. Now, I'm not a physician and I'm not a psychiatrist and I certainly don't want to overreach, but I think it's a really important point to make. And I think I'll end on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fulner. Furness, your point about increasing supports for parents and other caregivers during the pandemic, rather than just accepting that that's a side effect was very well taken. Dr. Grant, I'd now like you to, I'd like to invite you to deliver your final rebuttal and closing remarks. Yes, th thank you very much. And um, thank you um, everyone again for, for participating. I think the first point I want to make is addressing a fundamental error that's being made and saying that closing schools changes community spread. And the fundamental question to ask in this is if children aren't in school, where are they? They aren't many cases sitting at home alone with a single parent, okay? They're with their grandparents in multi-generational homes. So I wanna emphasize that BC in, had schools open, including in Surrey, which has multiple multi-generational homes. And it was not children that was bringing it home to multi-generational homes, it was essential workers bringing the people living alone in their single family home, their um, Amazon packages and their meat. So closing schools only stops spread if children cease to exist outside of school because they're still out in the community, as it's been said, and they're still just as at risk and probably more so because there isn't a trained responsible adult who's addressing that. 
Okay, I also want to address the issue about mobility data. People initially thought the mobility data was the most important aspect of controlling disease. This is not true. It has been countered in the Lancet by both Bader and Galato. Um, there was an initial correlation that has broken down and I can tell you why. I can drive 100 kilometers from here and be on a country road with no one around me. My biggest risk is bears and cougars. I can walk three blocks down my street and spread COVID. It's not mobility that's important, it's the interactions. And we can address those by arranging for kids to take school buses, not letting parents out of their cars. Um, there's many other mitigation measures that we haven't even tried that have nothing to do with school. We have what if our kids to death. What if kids are at risk? Well, they're not. What if teachers are at risk? They haven't shown to be. What if what kids spread disease? They don't. Um, every cautious school closure has caused harm to children. We need to stop. Am I at my time? No, nope, you have a little more time. Okay. Um, and I wanted to address the, um, the variance issue. Um, every time we've looked at a variant, the morbidity and mortality in children has not changed. And I want to address the very specific B1617.2, the um, variant that has been mentioned now. In the UK- 30 seconds. It has been shown from the B117, which is a mortality of 2% in the British population, the mortality is 0.2% for this um, organism. Now, that is with vaccines, but that's the point. We have vaccines. No, none of the variants to date have been shown to be more dangerous and not covered by vaccine. So we cannot, again, go through the what if, what if we close. There has to be demonstrated harm benefit before we go to that, and it has to be clearly demonstrated harm um, to children. Thank you, Dr. Grant. I'd now like to invite Dr. Martha Fulford to deliver her three minute final rebuttal and closing statements. Thank you. I mean, I'm going to reiterate uh, what uh, both Drs. Grant and Putnam have said that it is time to start using real life data when we look at what's going on with schools and our children. Uh, and we now have many jurisdictions, including as has been very uh, clearly pointed out, British Columbia, that school closures are not in fact necessary in order to control community transmission. But again, I would emphasize that we cannot, we simply cannot only consider COVID. Any intervention that we offer must be taken into the account with the harms, uh, associated harms. And so indeed, if we're actually advocating for the safety of our children, if that is our number one priority, then it is clear that being in schools is overwhelmingly safer for our children and for our youth in every single way. It's important for the marginalized, it's important for the vulnerable, it's important for the children who have no access to outdoors, it's important for the children who are living in small apartments. There is a very strong and clear association between social isolation and mental health deterioration. And this association points to the importance of in-person school, of recreation, of social activities, and of milestone events. If we want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the testing, I don't know how much we want to insist on, on this witch hunt of asymptomatic testing, but we now have both asymptomatic viral testing and seroprevalence studies that have addressed this potential. We have studies from Italy, from Norway, from Australia, and most recently British Columbia, that has shown that widespread COVID transmission is actually very rare in school setting. And in Ontario, as of April 30th, we had done 56,183 asymptomatic tests in our schools, and we had identified only 411 for a 0.7% positivity rate. At what point will we believe the data that we are not seeing secret silence spread in our schools? And again, we can make no decisions about COVID without also looking at, at One minute collateral more. damage. And so for me, when we did the school closures, they were actually done to protect adults. They were not done to protect children. For children and for youth, for their safety, for their future, we simply can't keep doing this. Children are not shields for adults. Going forward, I would argue that we have recognized that schools are important. We must keep them open. And because of the harm we've done, we actually, we actually now need substantial sustained investment in our, in our education system to try to mitigate some of these harms. And going forward, I don't think we can ever, ever again forget that children, their education, that is our future. And when we start to talk about harm mitigation, we need to control COVID. 
but we must also minimize the harm to our children because that is our future. I'm going to end with that. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. That was a powerful ending. Um, at this point, I'd just like to draw everyone's attention to the fact that we're at our time. I sincerely apologize about going over, as we say in journalism, in a shocking turn of events. Um, the debate has run over time. It's a little bit par for the course, but we'll do our best to finish up in the next five or 10 minutes. Um, I'd now like to invite Dr. Andrew Morris um, to deliver the closing rebuttal and final remarks for the con side. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Thank you. Um, there's no question that the pandemic sucks. Uh, everyone suffered, including our children. But it's also fantastical thinking to believe that we can just close our eyes to an extremely important workplace in our society, schools, and believe that we can ignore it to the exclusion of everywhere else. I'm really appreciative of everyone, um, including our, my co-panelists who would advocate for children. We all should. In fact, we should advocate for all vulnerable members of our society. But advocacy isn't pandemic control. And we're not really talking about advocacy here. We're talking about pandemic control. Just like I want you to pay attention to the somewhat equivocal data around what we know to some of the har harm to kids being um, uh, that they experience with short-term school closures compared to the fairly unequivocal data demonstrating uh, the harms to um, really all members of society with poor COVID control. And that's the illness, hospitalization, and loss of their parents and people in their communities. The decision of whether we keep a workplace open or not during a pandemic or an infectious disease outbreak is made by balancing the risks and benefits to those inside and outside that workplace, how we can mitigate those risks, and the value we place on those workplaces. We can't totally close hospitals, but we do shut them down to some degree with outbreaks, just like we do long-term care facilities, shelters, group homes, and pretty well every other workplace. We do everything we can when there's an outbreak or we need to for infectious disease control. And whether or not you do that to schools depends on how you have done with all other pandemic control. But it's purely fantastical thinking to believe that schools as an indoor congregate setting is somehow magically different than any other indoor congregate workplace. And even though I'm an advocate for schools and kids, because I do believe in the net, they are absolutely important and beneficial and essential. Please also don't portray them totally as idyllic. Many kids do thrive at school, but some kids don't. There are potential harms that kids, some kids experience, but by and large, schools are beneficial. But if you wanna advocate for kids and the health of every, them and everyone around them, the most you can do is advocate for optimal pandemic control. Kids will benefit the most when the pandemic is optimally controlled. They will have more time in school and they will have healthier people around them. So you advocate rather than never shutting down schools, advocate for the masking and ventilation and appropriate testing in communities with high transmission rates. You advocate for the parents and guardians and teachers and everyone else getting vaccinated to keep the schools as safe as possible. Thankfully, in the immediate future, most will rely on maximizing vaccination, that includes kids, but it might all, not always be thus. We may be faced with a situation in the very near future where there's gonna be a fairly vaccine resistant and perhaps um, virulent um, variant. And it's more plausible, more than plausible, it's possible. And the decision on whether schools should stay open should be primarily made on our ability to control the pandemic with or without schools. Yes, kids in schools matter, but so does a disease that has infected 1.4 million Canadians. It's hospitalized over 75,000 of us, including 1,300 kids, and it's killed 26,000 people. Much of those deaths are excess deaths. They're not expected deaths. Schools should be the first workplace to open, and they should absolutely be the last one to close during a pandemic. They shouldn't be closed for prolonged periods of time, and I'm really saddened that they have. But, but for Arthur's sake, sweet little Arthur, let's make these decisions based on data and basic principles of pandemic management. And let's not draw a line in the sand minute, that ignores the reality of infectious diseases transmission. I'll stop. Thank you, Dr. Morris, for your final remarks. Um, our final affirmative speaker today is Dr. Eric, 
Dr. Ari Bittinen. He'll be providing the last rebuttal and closing remarks of the pro sides and the final speech of the day. Thank you, Dr. Bittinen. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we've pretty much presented good data to show that SARS-CoV-2 generally causes mild disease. And uh, I think so far this holds true for the variants as well. Schools are generally safe, and it's not that no transmission happens in school, but by and large, it is limited and much less than what happens in the community. I want to reiterate the precautionary principle that it depends on your perspective. So from the perspective of child well-being, the precautionary principle would be that children should be in school, not out of school. Now, I would like to be a little more optimistic than Andrew. Um, I think we need to recognize that SARS-CoV-2 is an endemic virus now. We are going to need to learn to live with it. It isn't going to disappear. And I am hopeful that vaccines actually will do a good job of controlling this, including variants. We've already shown that we can develop vaccines very rapidly, and I think we will continue to be able to do so for variants. So we need good surveillance in place so that we can detect these and address them in a timely manner. But the reality is we're gonna need to learn to live with this virus. So children should go back to school, we should have appropriate surveillance in place to detect these viruses so we can update vaccines and immunize. Lastly, I'm gonna be brief um, because everyone has said, well, one more thing on, on, I think important to mention is equity. I think the people that suffered the most here are the people that are the most vulnerable and that is not just children. And I've noticed in my clinic, for example, I follow some uh, children depending on their underlying conditions for many years. And I've noticed over the last year, a significant increase in two things, one, teenagers that are developing manifestations of eating disorders, which has exploded. And number two, children that don't leave the house and have gained 15, 20 kilograms in a year. So we're causing them to become obese, which is the number one risk factor for severe COVID in children. Okay, and now, so I'll finish with a quote attributable to Nelson Mandela, where he said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. We have failed our children we must do better. Thank you. Finishing with the bang. Thank you, Dr. Bittman. And thank you, everyone. This concludes the first installment of the COVID debates on school closures. Our debate today was informative, evidence-based, collegial, and so, so eye-opening. Um, there was no epistemic trespassing today. And uh, Arthur will be happy to note that we covered all varied points of view. I'd like to now open up the poll for those of you who are still, who are still with us. Um, we have a few questions about uh, before and after your thoughts. The winner is usually determined by the delta change in debates. So we take a pre-debate vote, how many for or against a resolution, and a post-debate vote, and the largest change is the winner. How many people were you able to convince to change your minds? However, today our aim was not to find a winner, but to learn something new. Uh, I know that I did, and I am very, very hopeful that you did as well. I wanted to take this moment to thank our speakers for the wisdom, courage, and advocacy that brought you all here today. We cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your busy clinical schedules to offer your insights, answer my multiple annoying emails, and step outside your comfort zone to join us for this debate. You have our respect and gratitude, not just for today, but for the countless hours you spend in helping us fight this pandemic. Ford does not appreciate you like we do. And a special thank you to the whole Healthy Debate team, especially Dr. Seema Marwaha, our editor-in-chief, and Leon, our technical staff. Um, our goal at Healthy Debates is to provide trustworthy health information to the public. Check us out at healthydebate.ca. I'd also like to personally thank the whole team at the Department of Medicine for envisioning this event and bringing it to life, particularly Dr. Jane Bad for her vision, Dr. Rupert Call for his willingness to write shameless invitations to our speakers, and Dr. Jillian Hawker for taking a chance on us. Also, the wonderful DOM communications team, Margaret and Melanie, and most of all, thank you to all of you, our audience and our colleagues for taking the time out of your busy clinical schedules and virtual fatigue to join us for this event and support our vision of respectful professional dialogue. Let's see what the poll showed. Okay, so it looks like previously in support before um, was pretty much tied. Now in support of the resolution, um, more are in support now than were previously. It seems like it's a pretty equal debate. I think we'll have to take it back to um, check out the numbers though. Wow, this was a very close debate. I'm just gonna stop sharing. Can we stop sharing the poll?
I think that just goes to show the quality of our speakers and the quality of all the points that were brought here today. Um, thank you very much again, everyone, for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your Monday.